I am in the lovely gardens of Fenton House in Hampstead at the Idler Festival. I'm speaking about artificial intelligence and thought to give a summary of the 10 points I want to make about artificial intelligence, this huge subject that I fear is getting caught up in the lockdown mentality. Since the pandemic, there's been this tendency when something feels existentially threatening to very quickly go to turn it off, shut it down, try to force it into a box to contain it with complete understanding why it can be terrifying. But I think with the AI, perhaps in retrospect, easier to say, but nonetheless, in retrospect with the pandemic too, there's more that can be understood. And I fear that a kind of collusion between the technology industry and the media is taking away the opportunity we have to understand AI because actually there are some basic things that can be understood that help us to navigate this no doubt massive change, this massive revolution in how things are done and that will bring about great good as well as no doubt great risks and even evils which we're seeing played out now but that's not to say we shouldn't understand it's precisely to say that we should so we don't go into these panicky reactions and so this is what I'm going to try and bring to the audience here in leafy Hampstead so my first point is that we have passed the Turing test this famous test devised by Alan Turing roughly saying that if you can't tell the difference between a computer and a human when you're interacting with this entity then the computer can be said to be intelligent although the detail on this point that I want to make is that Alan Turing himself and many others in AI since have said it's not a very good test. The reason why Alan Turing said it's not a very good test is actually rather fascinating. He believed in telepathy, as many physicists and scientists have done across the course of the 20th century. They, they speak out about it less now. But nonetheless, he thought that one of the reasons why the Turing test wasn't a very good decider on whether a computer was intelligent or not is because he believed we human beings communicate in these subtle, even esoteric ways, and a computer could never do that. So that is one thing to bear in mind and opens up this rather larger point that I want to make that the AI is a, ch a chance for us to think again about our own intelligence. What actually goes on when we're alive, when we're experiencing, when we're interacting, when we're participating in life. And this very description of the Turing test gives one perhaps surprising indicator of that much more expansive sense of capacity that our intelligence has that the AI doesn't. Point number one. Point number two is to think about how therefore it is that the fear of AI so grows, so builds. Um, why does it so quickly become an existential threat? It's partly because with ChatGPT, very suddenly there was this technology that passed the Turing test. But there's deeper factors going on as well. And a bit of psychology, I think, helps here. You know, AI leaders are working in an industry that bets on the future and the money is made, the fame is won, if you can be the leader that is seen to be bringing about that revolutionary future. And so there's huge financial and egoistic reasons for AI leaders to oversell their product. And this is one of the ways in which the kind of collusion bears down that there are those who fancy themselves to be gods of tomorrow who are very prepared to come up with alarming statements that then the media picks up, particularly in this ex age of existential concern. And then we are forced into the position of not knowing what the experts are talking about. And before you know what happened, you know, you've got this kind of panic on your mind. So bear in mind how AI also fosters a certain kind of psychic reaction because it is so part of our dreams of the future when really it's actually a comment on how we're feeling about ourselves today. And this is my third point, how we human beings tell ourselves that we're foolish, ignorant, 
fearful, anxious creatures. We've sort of forgotten about the good that's within us. And so the AI leader who comes up and tells us that tomorrow we'll be saved by the technology, well, either saved or destroyed, fe feeds directly into that. And so we've got to turn the AI spotlight, not just onto the leaders in the field, but also onto ourselves and ask ourselves, you know, what desires, what fears, what hopes, what sense of despair is playing out in this story as well. You know, the AI promise is that fears will be dissolved, that desires will be fulfilled, even on the biggest of matters like life and death. So asking ourselves what kind of psychology is at play within us is also a really important question to ask because if you understand how you're being driven in your response to a sense of threat, then you begin to detect a sense of space around that threat and that then enables you to respond differently, more freely, more expansively, to consider, to understand. Don't get locked into the panic. Fourthly, and this is to make slightly more technological points about AI, moving on from the psychology. AI's model, that's what a lot of science does. Um, scientists build models of reality, they test the models against reality, and then use those models perhaps to produce technology, to make predictions. And what seems to happen with the AIs is that, sure, they model our cognition in various, at least probably constrained, but in certain ways. But then that model gets almost instantly confused with intelligence itself. You know, this doesn't happen in other areas. When I was doing my physics degree, my physics tutor, Carlos Frank, um, never once confused the fact that he builds models of the solar system of the universe, the cosmos as a whole on computers and runs them and then sees how the models match up with reality. He never confused that with building a universe itself. He never once came up to us and said, I built a universe today, or a universe has woken up inside my computer. And yet, for some reason, that seems to happen with the AI modeling of our cognition. I think it's because we've already got used to the idea that our minds are machines. The ground has been prepared for this fantasy that therefore the AI machine is, first of all, like our minds, and then, of course, getting better than our minds. But we don't exist in reality by modelling. Our minds work in really very, very different ways. And this takes me to the fifth point, which is that, you know, we don't calculate. What we do is we dwell in presence. There's a tuba warming up in the background. But think about memory and how a memory might come back to you. You know, you walk down the street, you pass your favourite cafe, you see a tree and in an instance a memory comes back to you. It's quite surprising you can remember something someone said to you in that moment. You can remember what you were listening to in that moment. Uh, you might get a flashback to childhood in that moment. Proust of course famously dwells on this when he eats the madeleine at the beginning of In Search of Lost Times. What we don't do is rush through our memory banks seeking to recall to bring to mind a memory in that way. Our minds work in very different ways, through presence, not calculating. And another very common experience that I think shows this is when you can't quite remember the name of someone or somewhere, or you can't quite recall how to do something, it's on the tip of your tongue. And the worst thing you can do is try to actively recall the name, recall the detail you've lost. It's much better just to relax into the sense of presence, and then it will, recome, it will come back to you. Another third way in which our memory clearly isn't like, our minds clearly aren't like computers, is that we don't need to plug in more brain as our memories increase in number. Um, across the course of a lifespan, the brain, if anything, apparently contracts in size, not grows in size. And yet, of course, our memories increase across the course of our lives. A computer would need to open up new data warehouses to store all that data. We don't operate like that. Um, I mean, to my mind, actually, what this all points to is that our memory is actually stored, if that's even quite the right word, our memory mm -hmm. lives in the world around us and that our brains, partly what they do is sift and shape and participate in that wider sense of memory and presence. And so they're operating really in a very, very different way from how a computer ever does. But even if you don't buy that complete idea that 
memory exists around us, not is stored within us. Nonetheless, it clearly operates our minds very differently from a computer. That would be my point number five. Point six, technology is wildly unadaptive, whereas we human beings are very adaptive, very responsive to whatever environment we're in. Think about a car, a very transformative piece of technology. And yet, without the road system, a car will be completely useless. And I think another thing that's going on in this AI discussion is that the world in which we live, or at least believe we live in, has already been adapted for this kind of technology. And so when the technology shows up, driving efficiency, driving control, driving logic, driving the accumulation of data, it seems like it's taking over the world. It's not actually, it's just that we've already backed ourselves into the world that suits the AI. A bit like living in a world that's full of roads upon which a car can then drive. But remember, the technology isn't adaptive. Take the roads away, the car's completely useless. We are, we grow into the cosmos in which we live. I think because we participate in the cosmos in which we live. That's a sixth point to bear in mind in these AI discussions. Challenging this idea it's taking over the world. It's not, it's rushing into a world which we've already prepared for it. Seventh, and this is related, we, attend to the world as well as feel its presence and participate in it. But how we attend to the world deeply affects the world that shows up. Attention is a moral act, as Ian McGilchrist has been saying, making a lot of the running in these debates now. And that means that if we can become aware of our fears, our desires, all the psychology and the dreams that are going on when we're attending to the world, we can decenter those concerns, as it were, step to one side of what the ego would have us focus on, collectively or individually, and see more. And I fear that this is part of what is happening in the panic around AI, is that the attention gets more and more focused, tragically, on to the side of life that suits technology, and we lose more and more touch with the side of life that exists beyond that kind of capacity. So. Ask yourself how you're attending, what you're focusing on, and again, learn to step to one side of that. Foster the ways in which we can attend to the world differently. Enjoy the sunshine in a garden. Communicate with other people as few human beings. Even be open to these more esoteric ways in which we interact with the world, the dreams, the moments of synchronicity, the telepathy. That is all to widen the attention. And it's one of the opportunities at this moment that perhaps we're awakening to the sense in which we've become far too narrow with our engagement in life, and so can grow that once more. Point seven. Point eight. The technology is not going anywhere, and I think the way that it will develop, and various AI experts that I have been speaking to um, have been suggesting this, is in a more cybernetic direction. So this is to recognise that the technology, the AI, is actually our tool. It can enhance things for us, but when it's in the service of the life that we want to live. Cybernetics is known for that. The cybernetic arm facilitates the human person in living a human life, rather than the large language models, which are actually not remotely interested in life as it's actually lived. They just dwell in the data set. And so I think and hope that a cybernetic direction is likely to be the future. People are saying actually that large language models have already exhausted their growth in this sudden rush that's produced chat GPT and others. It's consumed all the data that's out there and it's now cannibalizing on the data because it's, it's become a major data producer. You know, some people are even saying, have you noticed how Google searches are not as good as they were? Um, maybe there's already a sense of degeneracy building into this large language model approach. And so I think this will nudge things towards the cybernetic tomorrow, which I think will be better because it will ask us what we human beings want and then how technology can serve us once more as tools. Point eight. Point nine. Part of how it will serve us, no doubt, is by easing suffering, by helping us to connect with others. And this, though, is to put an emphasis on another side of our intelligence, which is really important, and um, that you know, we strive, we long, we despair, we hope, and that love of life 
and fear as well, the shadow of love, is very much part of our intelligence. You know, what you love, a bit like what you attend to, very much shapes what shows up in life, who shows up in life. And I think, therefore, that the crisis moment that we're in the middle of now with AI, if we can become intelligent about it, understand it, maybe it'll return us to how love and longing, striving, despair is part of our engagement with life itself. There are figures in the AI world that are already onto this. They're building the next generation of artificial intelligence that mimics much more closely our biological, our embodied existence, um, trying to foster the capacity to have this sense of participation, this sense of presence, rather than just dwelling in a completely artificial data world. Now, what happens there? Who knows? But nonetheless, that reminds us our intelligence involves these qualities of striving, of longing, of despair, of love, of hope. And fostering that is really important, part of the response that we can have to this present crisis. And that leads me to the tenth point, which is to have patience. Some of the best things in life show up when we've waited, when we've embraced the boredom even of not knowing what's happened, certainly dwelt in uncertainty. And we get a sense of the subtler light that then draws us. We get a sense that our suffering can have meaning and so gradually converts into hope and a sense of expansion. And we dwell in different kinds of time, you might say. And whilst the AI only dwells in clock time, we can use clock time for sure, but also dwell in other qualities of time, chirological time in particular, even glimpses of eternity that open up to us. And so my tenth point about AI will be that if we reflect upon it, it not only can help us to realise that the Turing test is not as good as some people have said, although Alan Turing knew it wasn't, that we need to think about the psychology of the AI leaders and the media that's driving this panic. We need to think about our own psychology, thirdly, the fears that get activated by it. We need to think about how AI models and represents reality to us, whereas we don't operate in that way. In fact, fifthly, we don't calculate, we dwell in presence. Memory comes back to us in surprising ways and we participate in life which is all to say, sixthly, you know, we're highly adaptive creatures. It's part of our intelligence, part of our genius, part of our love. And we shouldn't be fooled that the AI is super adaptive as well. It's really not. That's also seventh to do with our attention. How we attend shapes what shows up. It's a moral act. And I think perhaps that's why the future of this technology, which clearly is coming and is going to um, affect life very dramatically but there's hope it could be in a more cybernetic direction it could become a tool that assists the expansion and engagement with life not one that feels like it's driving and narrowing our lives which is to say nightly it will be able to assist with our striving and our suffering as well as our our longing and our love if we're smart about it as of course other technologies have done in the past books being one obvious example. And so tenthly, we must be patient in this moment, I think. We must put up with the panic, try not to let it drive us, realise that it's addressing deep fears as well as deep hopes, but keep smart about that. And so gaze into a different tomorrow, aided by the technology, but driven by that which is always the case for we human beings, the sense of presence and participation in life in all its fullness.